So here we are. Um, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in uh, Ephesians 5. Uh, so if you could turn to Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. Um, this is an extraordinary moment we find ourselves in. And um, a couple of weeks back, I was due to deliver this sermon called uh, The Redemption of Time. And I find it it's kind of interesting that it didn't happen then, but is happening now. Um, we, we want to just talk about this morning time and what God has to say about that. I'm also indebted to my friend Phil Greenslade for some of his thoughts uh, this morning. Just going to um, look at this passage, uh, it's very short, just 15 verses 15 to 17. Um, I'm going to be reading from the SV. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This passage, you might think, promotes kind of like a Protestant work ethic, using every moment of every day fruitfully. But I want to ask, what does Paul actually mean here? What is fruitful? What, what, is, what is this actually about? I actually believe that God's word has something really important to say to us at this moment. Walking wisely is what this is about. He says, walk, look carefully on how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Wisdom isn't really about cleverness or being able to kind of come up with amazing solutions. It's actually about something that we can all access. And it's, it's in fact, we have a promise in God that if we lack wisdom, we can ask God for wisdom, who, James says, gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Godly wisdom is powerful because it opens up for us a heavenly and godly perspective on the situation. It changes what seems to be between a rock and a hard place into something of an opportunity. Paul encourages the reader to walk wisely. That is, as you travel through the life, that you do so with care. In part, of course, this is to do with, if you remember a few weeks back, we spoke about the triad of vices that are there to try and sink you, to try and t stop you moving on in God. It's partly about that, um, but it's also about being God-like. It's not about not doing, it's also about doing, being the imitation of God himself in life, in all situations. Apply care, Paul says, to how you live your life, your, your thoughts, be intentional, not just drifting, not, but neither are you paralysed due to fear and indecision. He then adds, make the best use of the time for the days are evil. I want to spend a couple of minutes looking at this phrase, make the best use of time. Then I want to unpack what it means for us in the past, in the present, and in the future. The words are translated in the EV as best use of time, or the NIV translates it, make the most of every opportunity. But those words literally translate to redeem the time, as, as it was in the AV. We find a similar phrase in Colossians 4, 5. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. In both of these phrases, in the original Greek, it's exagorazo kairos, redeem the time. Hear those two words. Exagorazo, to buy up literally to ransom, to rescue from loss. Ransom means to buy, to buy up, to set free by, by purchasing. You might have heard the phrase redeem the time, but here, quite literally, that is what it is saying. And then the second word adds an important element to this, kairos. This word kairos, translated as time, means time or season. The word kairos 
um, is interesting because Wikipedia has this to say about it. It says the ancient Greeks had two words for time, chronos and kairos. The former chronos refers to chronological or sequential time, whilst the latter, kairos, Signifi signifies a, a proper or opportune time, a time for action, if you like. Well, Kronos is quantitative, the seconds, the minutes, the hours. Kairos has a qualitative, permanent nature. So this word Kairos is less about the clock and more about the moment or the season, the immediate moment, but also the for such a time as this season. In some ways, actually, it's at the heart of the structure of everything that God give, has given us right from the beginning. Rest being an essential part of the rhythm of time. And in some ways, we've become detached as a society from that natural rhythm of the year, sowing, reaping, resting. But God himself shaped a rhythm around seven days. In the commandments... The Sabbath command number four, keep the Sabbath day holy, is the one set between the commands towards God and the commands towards man. The way we love God is reflected in how we love each other and it hinges on the Sabbath. Time itself and the understanding of time is transformed in God and particularly in Jesus through the saving and redeeming power of God. The qualitative nature of Kairos is illustrated in one theologian's suggestion that there have been, or perhaps are, three time zones for God's people. The first time zone he called Egypt time. Egypt time is about captivity, it's economic time. You see, there was no rest, there's no Sabbath in Egypt time. And ultimately, it's idolatrous, serving greed rather than God. Are you living in Egypt time? Are we enslaved or consumed with the task of making money or being successful in a worldly way? Success is wonderful, but is it at the expense of our own lives and relationships, especially our relationship with Father God? The second time he suggests is Exodus time. Exodus time by comparison is freedom. It's not freedom from work, but it's a godly rhythm. Done free, work done by free men and free women. Worshippers first, children of God, and workers second. However, there's another time. A time that we can live in, Easter time. And shouldn't Easter time be even more free? Because as the work of Jesus upgrades everything through his saving grace. We live AD, not BC. Jesus was the turning point of history, the turning point of time, turning point of the epochs themselves. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Paul writes to the Galatians, Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to yoke of slavery. See, we're set free from the rules and the requirements of the law, setting time free to redeem, to buy back the moment by connecting with the wisdom of God, not in allowing the days to be used for evil. Right at the start of the letter, Paul writes this to the Ephesians in chapter 1, verses 7 to 10. He says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, while he lavished upon, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, there's that word kairos, the fullness of the season, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, things on earth. Time is our friend, actually, and God has time in his hands. We are moving towards the fullness of times, 
the fullness of Kairos. For God's plan has been set forth in Christ, a plan that had remained a mystery until Christ came and revealed the sheer breadth and the, of that plan to redeem mankind and to unite all things in Christ. Redeeming the past means living in peace with the past, being strengthened by what was good and finding peace with what wasn't. The only way to bring healing to the past is by practicing forgiveness. The only way to honor the past is by practicing thanksgiving. Redemption costs, it carries a price. And that price is to start the letting go process. There's an American novelist called Anne Lamont and she says, speaks of giving up hope of a better past. You see, the past is what it is. Let's not try and rewrite it or reframe it. It is done. But today is about honouring what was good and practising forgiveness for what wasn't. And that isn't easy. I know it isn't. But the only way to make peace with one's own past is by being forgiving and by being forgiven. Bitterness hurts us and fossilises the past. Forgiveness is the biggest moral miracle there is, and it's the work of God alone. It can only be done by being forgiven. Otherwise, the past just remains as unredeemed and evil. As we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us, and we have received forgiveness. One of the hardest people actually to forgive is ourselves. But if God has forgiven you, if God has forgiven me, what rights do I have to hold grudges? Forgiveness isn't about pushing something under the carpet, but it is about handing over our hurts and our disappointments and our failures to God. We need that, that need for retribution, hand it over to God. He is just and he is righteous and then leave it there so that the moment we live in is set free to display this wisdom of God, which is what this world needs at this moment. We spoke a few weeks ago about practicing forgiveness. Thanksgiving pulls out from the past grace and mercy. And the result is godliness. Do you remember that? Bringing hope and opportunity to the future. It learns to recognise the hand of God in our lives and re-centres him as the object of our worship. In a call to repentance, to true, restored, loving relationship with God, the prophet Joel paints a picture of an army of locusts wiping out everything in their path because the people had turned their back on God and on the Sabbath, on God's rhythm in life. But in response to the repentant heart, God promises in Joel 2.25, he says, I will restore, I will pay back to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army, which I sent amongst you. The restoration of the damage of the past begins with repentance and forgiveness. Even here, time itself finds restoration. How good is that? In the present, Paul has already been setting the scene. He says, in, remember in chapter 4, verses 26 to 27, he says, Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity for the devil. Better to redeem the day than let the devil have it. But rather, let us talk, our talk be of building each other up as fits the occasion. Do you remember that? How he contrasted not speaking um, words that tear down, but words that build up. It's a beautiful skill and it's about grace being released to others through our words you know just a word or two sometimes in a moment a redeeming of that moment do you remember when jesus he sent the 12 out 
to heal and to drive out demons. And then after a few days, they all came back. They're full of amazing stories of seeing God at work in them. They were well excited for that. And Jesus then says to them, let's go and find somewhere quiet to wind down and debrief. A bit of a Sabbath moment, perhaps. But actually what happens is quite different. A massive crowd follows Jesus. They follow him into the wilderness and Jesus spends the day speaking to them and healing the sick. As the daylight starts to fade, the disciples who haven't had this downtime with Jesus yet says, send them back to the town so they can find food. And now you get this Kairos moment. We're tired, you're tired, we're all tired, send them away. Give us a break. But yet a greater moment, however, is waiting. Something that only one who is in tune with God the Father would hear. Jesus says, you feed them. And so often these moments, they come when we feel the least capable, when the demand seems so high, when all actually we want to do is zone out, where the world is, is in madness, when my jug is empty. But it's these moments when, if we're wise and if we're listening to God, we experience the amazing moments in God. And we reach out our hand and God reaches out his hand. But who also knows that actually not everything is our problem. Our yoke, Jesus says, is easy and our burden is light. Brothers and sisters, we need the wisdom of God to know what is ours and what is someone else's. And finally, I just want to talk, touch on the future. You see, we are temporal creatures. Our allotted time is brief. Psalm 90 says, like grass that is renewed in the morning, in the morning it flourishes and is renewed, and in the evening it fades and withers. Recognising our mortality enables us to redeem what we have and brings wisdom. Nine, Psalm 90 carries on in chapter, verse 12, says, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. And then again in verse 14, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. And finally, verse 17, let the favour of the Lord God, Lord our God, be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. The psalmist here has got hold of something here and he's saying, you know, my, my time is limited. I've only got so much time. God, use what I've got and establish what, you, what I do with my hands that it may, it may be something that is a memorial, is, a, is, is something of worth, something of value in eternity. You see, our labour is not in vain. We're called to be human and being truly human, we're called to leave a legacy. But how do we do that? Just some ideas here, some thoughts. Sorry. The first is relinquish control of the future. All things, including my own story, will all be pulled together into something meaningful. God is providential. He does provide. We don't need to live in any fear or to force changes in history. We cannot make his kingdom come. The end of the story is in God's hands. Bearing with one another in love requires time and patience. We have all the time in the world. We forbear because we want enough time for grace to take effect. Slowing down and allowing God to work. The Anglo-Saxon um, have this phrase about time running out. Perhaps I prefer the Spanish phrase which says time is walking out. Jesus was, it seems, able to sleep perfectly well despite not all people having been healed. Thirdly, making time for worship. 
the story of the woman who anoints Jesus with, with that expensive ointment is accused of wastage. Praise in some ways serves no earthly practical purpose. You could almost say it's useless, but as itself, it is the reason for doing it. It is a delightful waste in that sense. Sunday was given the first day of the new creation as a time of worship, a time for delightful waste. Living out redeemed time isn't living for the weekend, but it's living in an octave week, Sunday to Sunday. Fourthly, taking time to rest, the Sabbath, buying it back, redeeming it from the 24-7 relentless life, stepping back from the phone, from emails, etc. Fifthly, living in the eternal now, not just living for the next thing. Jesus said, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. It's Matthew 6, 34. T today, he says, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. It's a time to open up our hearts to Jesus, to not take everything upon us and to find peace in God. Finally, living in hope, living in hope on the Easter side of reality. The fear of mortality gives way to hope now and hope in eternity. Christ is the same today as he was yesterday and he will be tomorrow. This life, brief though it is, leads onto something on a far more epic scale. In eternity, there's no clicking clock, ticking clock. <laughs> Sorry, there's still, there will be epochs though, times of celebration, times of feasting, times of work, times of creating. The nature of God doesn't end, but we are then fully like him and will delight in the work of our hands, just as he delights in all that he has made and done. The past is redeemed by receiving and giving forgiveness and honouring what was good. Sometimes knowing that Jesus was with you in some of those tough battles can help to bring that closure forgiving yourself for mistakes, for poor choices. In the present, redeeming the time then is about walking in wisdom, demonstrating the multicoloured wisdom and love of God in a world that so desperately needs it, bringing peace which it so desperately needs at this moment. We are peacemakers, hope bringers. We're learning to love just as we are loved. The future is in God's hands but our time is brief and with that knowledge comes wisdom that we live in the hope of an eternal God but the time now needs us fully present not consumed with what might have been or what might be but in the here and now knowing that God is on the move uniquely in us but moving all things closer closer to all that he is doing, that final shout when all things are restored. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the Alpha and the Omega. All things are in you and all will be accomplished through you. Jesus, give us wisdom, we pray, to discern your will and to catch a glimpse of what you're doing in and through us. May we be attentive to you to catch those moments of joy when you move in us, move us in a different direction and your kingdom breaks in. Thank you, Lord. Give us the courage to face the past and see it all through your eyes. Give us the strength to give, forgive where we need to and find you in all that we've experienced. I ask all this in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh yeah.